Good evening. Um, thank you for your patience. And if you'll give us about five more minutes worth of patience. Um, those of you who know me know that I usually, my name's Billy White, the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, but I usually explain to people that there's only two things that keep, keep people from coming to an event, and that's good weather and bad weather. <laughs> so tonight we have one of those two things, and so because the subways are so messed up and things, we're gonna give people a few more minutes to arrive, and um, it's unfortunate that we've lost some people because we, we uh, had probably 100 people coming, but the show will go on, and those of you who brave the weather will get a treat. So give us about five minutes, thanks. Good evening. Um, thank you again for waiting, and we did get a few more people in. Um, again, my name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, and I welcome you here to LBI and the Center for Jewish History. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we were founded in 1955 to preserve and promote the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry. As such, we have a research library and archives that contain the most significant collection of source material relating to the history of German-speaking Jewry. But our work does not stop at being an archive and a library. Um, we sponsor programs that promote this history, uh, both for its own sake, but also for its relevance to today. And I think tonight's program about Weimar Germany is an excellent example of how we live out our mission in our programming. The Weimar Republic is much studied, much represented in literature and film, and sadly provides some interesting comparisons to contemporary issues in the world today. So I'm gonna introduce our two speakers who, for those of you who brave the weather, are in for quite a treat. Um, Carrie Wallach is Associate Professor of German and Chair of the German Department at Gettysburg College, where she's also an affiliate of the Judaic Studies Program and contributes to the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program. She earned her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and was an undergraduate at Wesleyan University, where I worked at the same time, although we did not know each other. Uh, Carrie's research focuses on 20th, 20th century Germany and German Jewish culture, as evidenced by her new book, Passing Illusions, Jewish Visibility in Weimar, Germany. Um, she serves on uh, our academic advisory board of the Leo Beck Institute also. Noah Eisenberg is professor of culture and media from the New School. Uh, he has degrees in European history, German literature, and German studies. Before the New School, Noah taught at, the Wesleyan, at Wesleyan University, <laughs> where I did have the pleasure of knowing him, and the two of them knew each other. As a matter of fact, Noah uh, supervised Kerry's senior thesis. Beyond his role as a teacher and scholar, Noah is a literary and cultural critic with a wide and deep knowledge of German and Austrian literature and cinema. And to round it out again, Noah also serves on LBI's academic advisory board. So we welcome the two of them up and again, uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Is it really raining outside? Uh, so this is quite a pleasure to share the stage with Carrie. Uh, as Billy Weitzer just announced, I, I had the earlier pleasure of having supervised her honors thesis in the College of Letters at Wesleyan University, a thesis on the poet Elsa Lasker Schuler. That's a couple years ago. Um, and I cannot say enough good things about this, about this book. And so the opportunity to discuss your book, Carrie, and to connect it to some of the important themes of Babylon Berlin, Berlin uh, really just seemed too good of an opportunity to pass up. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, what we, Carrie and I have spoken about this, I'm just, I'm gonna lead now and then I'm going to be quiet. But what I wanted to do uh, is to sort of give you a, a sense of the format It'll be mainly a conversation. Uh, Carrie's gonna talk about her book. We'll talk, as I said moments ago, about some of the points of intersection between her research uh, for Passing Illusions and this big budget German television production that just began airing on Netflix a few months ago. Um, at the outset though, Carrie was gonna say just some general words about, about the book to give you a better idea. Before she does that, let me just say, and I hope this won't embarrass you, 
you must buy this book. Uh, it, it will be available for, for purchase. It's, it's, it's uh, $5 less than what they're selling it on Amazon. So can you believe that it's a metzia? It's a bargain. Um, I'm not collecting a percentage. Um, but this will be afterwards. It's available for $25. And I encourage all of you to go out there and get a copy. But Carrie, you were going to say uh, just some general words about the, about the book, and then we're going to focus in on some of the themes. She's prepared a wonderful slideshow. We have some clips as well, and we will get to all of that. But please, Carrie Wallace. Thanks. Uh, first, I just wanted to make a, a nice pun about the weather. We had some uh, passing illusions of good weather today, um, but turned out not so nice. Uh, I also wanted to thank Billy and um, Frank Mecklenburg and um, David Brown, Michael Simonson, and others at the Leo Beck Institute who've uh, invited me to talk about my book and share, um, share my material with you. And also Noah, of course, who's supported my work for about 17 years, so that's a long time. Um, so, so many of you, I hope, um, have seen at least one episode or a little bit of the show Babylon Berlin, um, and, and it's very gripping, right? You're all intrigued by it. And so like many viewers of this show, um, I first became interested in the Weimar period because of the tension, because of the paradoxes that this show really embodies and brings to life. Um, it's this moment in time when, um, especially for Jews, there were so many questions that seemed really unanswerable. Uh, and now, today, maybe in 2018, as, as uh, Billy hinted, they're starting to become, they start, they start to seem less impossible to us, some of these paradoxes. How could this democratic period when Jews possessed more rights than they had ever uh, possessed in, in German history um, be followed by the levels of persecution uh, that it was? So um, this, for me, is, is the sticking point. Jews finally gained full access to privileges in Weimar, Germany. Um, but they still thought twice before openly or publicly announcing their Jewishness. Jewishness was still a point of contention, something that could provoke anti-Semitic responses or attacks. Um, so my book is the, about the process of navigating visibility, about choosing when, um, when to announce when one's Jewishness, when to come out as Jewish, as it were. Um, and so I access this through this concept of passing, um, which I borrow from African-American studies and also LGBT studies or queer studies. Um, we, know, we know this concept from other disciplines and thinking about how it works in the German Jewish context is what I do in this book. Um, so I'm interested in these situations, these moments when two people encounter each other and are trying to figure out if the other person is Jewish, how do they go about that process? What does that process look like? Um, what questions do they ask? What hints do they drop? What conclusions do they make based on physical appearance, whether it's uh, somehow something on the body or uh, material signifiers, clothing? Um, and what I do in, in just sort of one sentence is um, most of the scholarship on Jews and Jewish identity in this period has suggested that uh, Jews more or less steered or erred on the side of invisibility, trying to be less visible. And I point in my book to moments when Jews wanted to be visible, when they wanted to um, be able to identify each other, to find community. And um, I argue that Jews tried to find each other, uh, though they were very cautious and careful about the ways in which they displayed Jewishness, and um, that they wanted to be safely visible as, as Jews. Um, so I don't know if now is a good time to, to move a little yeah, forward I, in this line. I, I, I think we should. So we're, we're going to structure things around images and then also around a couple of clips. Clips, one, one longish clip from the series from Babylon Berlin and also another clip from one of the films from the actual Weimar period that will help to kind of explicate some of the ideas that Carrie addresses in the book. Um, but we'll move through, through these images and through these uh, clips and then there will be time at the end for, for questions. I didn't state that earlier, but yeah, let's, let's, let's push on. I think there's lots to see here. So this, this first slide just sort of shows you one of the things that I'm hinting at, but I think is also a theme that gets picked up by Babylon Berlin, this theme of unmasking, this theme of um, bringing to light that which is hidden, of revealing concealed identities, um, of choosing to um, make identities, uh, or in, in the case of what I'm focusing on, Jewishness, uh, visible. Um, but then we come to, so this is from the first episode of Babylon Berlin, where our protagonist, uh, Gerion Rat, reads um, a, a 
placard, a poster that's on an advertising column. And we see, in, even in the subtitles, it translates what he reads, which is everyone wants in Berlin, jeder einmal in Berlin. Um, but the sort of subtext of this image, if you look very, very carefully in the background, and um, Noah in his short uh, piece on, on um, called Voluptuous Panic, uh, panic right? yeah. um, uh, on Babylon Berlin, also points out here in this scene, we see this sort of random group of Hasidic Jews wearing Stremel hats wandering through the background. Um, only in this first episode do we see it. And yeah, I say in the, in the, in the piece, you, the, 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 now you see the Hasid? <laughs> You see the there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole group of them. And, um, and, and just for a fleeting second, maybe a second and a half, the hussy just kind of traipses through the frame. But that's about it. That's what you get. A glimpse. You're sort of allowed to catch a glimpse of, of visibly Jewish culture. Of visible Jews. So if we compare this with, what, with how Jews depicted each other during the Weimar period, um, we see something a little bit different. Um, so this is a, an incredible photo montage that appeared in a uh, periodical in 1930. Um, it's by the photographer Abraham, uh, Abraham Pizarek, who's much better known for his work during the 1930s, during the Nazi period. Um, but this particular montage shows us um, all of the different ways that Jewish life was visible, or at least was understood to be visible by uh, this Jewish photographer. Um, and what we don't see is stray mal hats, interestingly enough, um, but we do see plenty of uh, religiously observant Jews clad in um, traditional East European garb. Uh, and we see, um, probably above all, um, people clustered around certain areas in Berlin. Um, and this, this particular street that they're in, the Granatierstrasse, is in the Scheunenviertel, uh, which also gets a shout out in Babylon Berlin. So that's uh, worth a reference as well. Um, and of course, uh, when we talk about Jewish characters in Babylon Berlin, the, the most easily identifiable Jewish character is uh, August Benda. And here he is with, um, with his wife and their um, maid. Um, but the Benda family uh, also um, has all kinds of connections to, to Jewishness in this show. Noah, would you like to talk a little yeah. more about that? Well we catch this, it's very late in the, I don't know how many of you have seen this, we have the first two series are now accessible via Netflix, and it's quite quite late in the, in the, in the second series that we really learn mm -hmm. about August Benda's mm -hmm. Jewish background. Mm -hmm. um, but he's a, a, a higher police official and is uh, a social democrat. Mm -hmm. um, but the exposure that we get to his Jewish life is definitely private. And it's not something that, that, that is really made visible. It's almost like the, the, the Hasid that we see early on in the show who sort of traipses into the frame. And you're able, you know, if you look carefully, mm -hmm. you catch, you catch uh, uh, a glimpse uh, of, of him in full garb and, and with his stremel. But in this case, too, you really, I think, need to be looking for it. That, that in other words, that... that uh, Jewishness during the Weimar Republic, as presented by a television show like Babylon Berlin, is something that is definitely for the private sphere and not so much explicit in the public sphere. Um, and these screenshots also yeah. show exactly what Noah's getting at, this idea that um, it, within the Benda home, there are Jewish objects. Maybe you see the maid cleaning a menorah at some point, but it's not really thematized beyond that. Yeah, the camera pans. I mean, again, once more, you need to really be looking. Yeah, it pans, but it's it, in multiple episodes, mm -hmm. I think the menorahs make an appearance. Um, but for me, the, the real um, interesting point was where he says he's secretly eating meat because his wife wants him to be healthy. And he says to the maid, you know, can you please... The maid says, you know, your wife prepared this healthy dinner for you. And he says, no, 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 no none of that. Um, I, I want to eat these sausages. I, I went and got them special. I've been looking forward to them all week. Um, you can only get them in the shoin and fertile, which, of course, is a reference to, I, in my reading, um, kosher, kosher meat. Um, so he's excited to eat his kosher, kosher yeah. sausages from the and it's, a, and it's a coded reference. And so that coded speech, again, if yeah. you think using the, the examples that you use late in the book, at the, in the introduction, but then also certainly in the conclusion, um, from African American culture as well as LGBT, I'm thinking specifically of James Baldwin and Audre Lorde mm -hmm. and their discussions of passing and being able to recognize. It was often done by way of code, different codes that would indicate 
one's identity that wouldn't be necessarily recognizable to the broader public. Yeah. Um, so that's a nice uh, transition into maybe I can just say a word about what I do in terms of comparative work in the book. Um, and it's important for me to emphasize that the concept of passing in Jewish studies really does um, originate with uh, African American studies, and it's not a Jewish studies concept by, by default. Um, and so for me, I look at commonalities and differences between German Jews and other populations, um, and I look at Jewishness as a form of minority visibility um, that's gendered and queer and racialized in my reading, and so I'm gonna tell you what that means. Um, so the concept of passing as it's associated with African American or racial passing um, has its origins in uh, the concept of runaway slaves and notices looking for these runaway slaves, looking for people who are trying to pass for free, um, and it came to take on a connotation of black passing for white, which was um, pretty much the same thing in the 19th century. Um, and by the early 20th century, the novels of the Harlem Renaissance, and you see a couple of them here on the left, um, Walter White's Flight and Nella Larson's Passing, um, passing in particular, um, really made this, help this term enter the, the common lexicon. Um, so we think about passing as this concept of trying to be something that you're not, or trying to be seen as something that you maybe don't see yourself as. Um, and uh, what I do in the first chapter of my book is think about the way that Jewish identity is also using some of these racialized concepts um, to think about uh, how, how Jews uh, and non-Jews, but also really I think it's important to point out um, Jews as well use these sort of forms of coding um, that were often um, drawing on racialized markers. So the idea that Jews have dark hair, Jews have dark eyes, dark coloring um, was one of the things that contributed to how people discerned or made judgments uh, about whether someone might be Jewish or not. Um, and what's interesting for me in, in particular is in African-American passing narratives, um, as well as in German-Jewish passing narratives that I look at in the book, um, female characters are depicted as more ambiguous, uh, more slippery, more mercurial, better able to pass, and thus often more likely to be the ones passing. Um, and if we uh, expand um, our conversation about uh, passing to um, forms of passing that could fall under the rubric of sexual passing or queer passing, um, we think about Jewishness as having some commonalities with this coded set of signifiers um, that's also used in the LGBT community. Um, in a world accustomed to closetedness, many uh, people in the LGBT community then as today um, used all kinds of subtle markers to con connote uh, membership in these communities. So um, passing might have been uh, some kind of necessary evil, and this is, this is thematized in the Weimar German film Anders aus die Anda, and I know the Leo Beck Institute had an event on this film um, uh, recently, um, or on this, on this concept, um, where we see people being blackmailed because of their um, either homosexual activity or alleged homosexual activity. Um, and we also see uh, in many films from the Weimar period all kinds of cross-dressing um, taking place in, you know, to various comedic effects, um, in, especially in the films of Ernst Lubitsch uh, and some other films as well. Um, so this, uh, I think, is a nice um, lead into the way that we see a lot of cross-dressing and drag also taking place in um, Babylon, Berlin. And um, this is from an earlier episode in the series, uh, but and not even perhaps the most famous uh, or the most well-known, but this one shows uh, the two protagonists of the Babylon Berlin, um, Charlotte Ritter and Gerian Rath, um, running into a colleague of theirs from the police force who's in drag at a bar, and they're there to um, have a conversation with uh, the singer uh, at this bar who's um, you know, a key witness or um, accomplice or a friend of, of Kardakov who they're looking for. Um, but Noah, this is where I think we could show that clip. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so could you show the clip from Babylon Berlin? Zu Asche, zu Staub, dem Licht geraubt, doch noch nicht jetzt. Wunder warten bis zuletzt. Ozean der Zeit, 
ewiges Gesetz. Zu Asch, zu Staub. Zu Asch. Doch noch nicht jetzt. So it's, that's, a, that's a long clip, and that's the only one you're going to see tonight from Babylon Berlin. Um, but it's one that actually encapsulates the whole spirit of the show, um, and to a certain extent, the spirit of, 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 of Weimar culture, at least the way in which Weimar culture is often remembered today. Um, you have a great deal that deals, uh, a great deal uh, of it has to do with, with, with masquerade, with cross-dressing, um, and then all these reference points that we today in 2018 might recognize, including the famous banana skirt that Josephine Baker wore when performing during the Weimar years in Paris as well as in, 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 in Berlin. And so when Carrie and I were discussing what, what to show from the, uh, the series, I thought this was an absolute must. But maybe you could talk about, again, different affinities 
between the scene that we just saw and some of the uh, forces at work in, in your book? Sure. Um, I especially want to mention, but also maybe later come back to the, the key figure, the singer Svetlana Sorokina, who's, who's singing in drag in that clip. Um, I think she um, sort of also embodies the ability to pass in many different ways, in many different contexts, um, not only uh, her performance in drag, but also she's uh, aligned with all kinds of different political factions um, throughout the show. And uh, we'll certainly avoid all spoilers here, but she's... Um, and that's another, another She's great very theme, slippery. Another dominant theme of the Weimar Republic, certainly, and this is goes, even goes back to Peter Sloterdijk's uh, uh, book uh, on the critique of cynical reason, which deals with this notion of imposterdom. Mm -hmm. And imposterdom is so important during that period. Uh, and she's one of the, the, the great imposters. And you can think of, in the realm of cinema, of, of Fritz Lang's Dr. Mabuse, for example, one of the great imposters. But, but, but Sorokina, is, 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 I think, fits into that, that whole lineage. Sure, and if we also wanted to think about her sort of political slipperiness as a way of passing, we can also extend that to other characters in the series. Um, oh, I don't know how to avoid spoilers in talking about all of it, but uh, we certainly have some um, uh, people who try to be seen as one political um, faction who we find out are, are members of a different political faction and that, and that plays a key role in some of the later, some of the later scenes. In, um... I know exactly, we we're gonna try to avoid spoilers. I thought that's why we could just show you that one scene because if you haven't had a chance to see the series, now maybe this uh, was a little uh, amuse-bouche. <laughs> um, yeah, com communists passing for Nazis, Nazis passing for communists, something like this. Um, and, uh, we also have, even our, our protagonist of the series, Geren Rad, is, is a pretty slippery fellow himself. We're not really sure where he stands politically, and he tries to fit in with every, at every party he's at, and in the police force, um, in different divisions of the police force. He's here, he's there, he's, he's everyone. And Volta, his partner, too, is another one of these characters mm -hmm. who's sort of keeping up appearances, but, but definitely is, has, has all sorts of ulterior motives and dis different schemes. Um, that, that nightclub, the Mocha uh, uh, Efti, where this, where this scene that you just saw takes place is also a realm that has different, different has that subterranean realm that where, you know, every, every erotic fantasy can be, can be played and is in fact played out and you have then up above, you have a restaurant, you have a cafe. And so there are different sort of social spheres as well that represent different, I think, facets of, of, of Weimar culture uh, writ large. Any, anything else we want to say about Babylon Berlin? Because I'm going to make I'll a big back. jump I, I after that. I think I want to come back to Babylon Berlin. I mean, this was the, the idea when we were putting together the program was to have it in conversation with passing illusions, but I really think the focal point should be on passing illusions. So, so I, I may interject a bit, bit later on, on Babylon Berlin, but I think we should, should uh, return to the book because the book, I think, jibes so nicely with, with a number of the, the core themes of the series. Okay, so we'll, we'll work our way back to, to Babylon Berlin in just a few minutes, but so bear with me. We're going to jump back in time like, like 800 years. Um, okay, um, so uh, again, bear with me. Um, we're not going to spend a long time uh, talking about the medieval and early modern period, but um, in order to understand Jewish visibility in the modern period, we have to take a step back also because some of these signifiers, some of these tropes come up uh, and are very important in the Weimar period and even into the Nazi period that some of you are probably more familiar with. Um, so the most important thing to know about Jewish visibility in Europe and in maybe Western Europe to be more specific um, is that it was only a choice beginning in the modern period. Um, so starting in the year 1215 and all the way to the late 18th century, sumptuary laws in various places in uh, Western Europe, which were not always enforced, but were certainly still on the books, um, sumptuary meaning relating to, to clothing, things that people wear, um, dictated that Jews had to be visible. They had to wear some kind of outward external marker of Jewishness on their clothing. So um, we see this in the form on the, on the left here, we see a Jewish hat. Um, in the middle, we see a yellow badge in a circular ring form um, from the 16th century. And on the right, we see um, a couple uh, from the early 18th century who are wearing not anything yellow, but rather um, a white rough collar. Um, so various different markers of Jewishness uh, become, um, we, see, we see here, um, were imposed from the outside. Where Jews were told they had to 
indicate their Jewishness. Um, again, in some places that these were um, on the books and possibly in place until the late 18th century. So if we move forward in time um, and we think about how Jews transitioned away from being publicly visible as Jews, we think about the Jewish Enlightenment, the Haskalah, um, uh, and we think about some of these, these mottos that maybe we've heard before um, that were essentially sort of the, the mottos of assimilation, of acculturation, of Jews becoming more like everybody else. Um, so be a man in the streets and a Jew at home is one that uh, Yudha Lev Gordon um, made well known and famous and we sort of retroactively apply it to the German Jewish um, uh, enlightenment. But it wasn't, it's not just us who are uh, retroactively applying it. Uh, in the Weimar period, too, this idea of being a Jew um, privately only at home and, and displaying Jewishness um, only where one, one was in a space where one could do it safely uh, became um, a point of contention between different Jewish groups and, and between people who were sort of struggling with how to display Jewish identity. Um, and one Zionist group uh, that I, uh, or what, that was quoted in a Jewish newspaper that I was reading as part of my research, um, sort of recast this motto. So instead of being a Jew only at home, they said be a Jew, Jew at home and also a Jew out there. Zayuda zu Hause und Jude draußen. Don't only be a Jew in, in private, feel, feel good enough about being Jewish to display it in public. So some of these tensions um, do start playing out uh, also into the Weimar period. And um, in summary of some of the um, points of contention that were in play, uh, here we see um, these are uh, sort of pared down for you here um, a little bit simplistically, but uh, the, the Zionist perspectives, which of course in the 1920s and early 1930s were only a small percentage, a small minority of Jews in Weimar Germany, um, maybe something like 15%, uh, advocated for taking pride in standing out uh, as some, someone different, resisting assimilation, uh, and also overriding that old enlightenment mentality of needing to fit in, needing to acculturate, um, and be uh, not necessarily needing to be like one's neighbors. Uh, whereas the liberal perspective really was much more in favor of blending in, uh, of being more German, seeming more German to the eye. Certainly fighting anti-Semitism, remaining on the defensive, um, but exercising caution um, when, when in public and especially near uh, synagogues. And we see that um, uh, we see that play out in the form of um, violence and especially attacks that took place near synagogues. And I'll get to that uh, in just a few minutes. But um, first, what I want to do is talk about some of the reasons why Jews uh, felt the need also to to control and uh, exert some kind of influence on or interest in um, also what other Jews were wearing um, and on the most base level. And this will, this will bring us back to Babylon, Berlin. Um, so it's important um, to point out that in the Weimar period in particular, uh, there were groups forming um, that were, that I call sort of groups that self-policed, that controlled um, or suggested to other member, other Jews sort of what Jews should wear. Um, and all of this was partly in, in conversation with or in response to um, some of these anti-Semitic stereotypes that had been in place um, for many hundreds of years, and uh, in the modern period, we see it um, already being put into images. So what you're looking at here is um, an anti-Semitic caricature from 1850 that was reprinted and, and well-known in the Weimar period as a caricature of Jews. Um, and so we see depicted here a Jewish woman. Um, we, can, we can point to her nose as an out, outward symbol of her exaggerated, grotesque, physical embodiment of Jewishness here. Um, and, and the caption just sort of makes a joke about the fact that when she wears her jewelry two or three times a year, so, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, um, it costs her about 1,600 gold in each time if you consider the interest uh, on the capital that it, uh, was invested in the jewels. So basically, this stereotype is suggesting um, that Jewish women, you know, married for titles, she's a baroness, um, and also uh, upward mobility and, um, and wealth and access to wealth. So these stereotypes of Jewish opulence become uh, particularly relevant um, when we think about fur, 
this, again, this is where we're going with, with Babylon Berlin. Um, we saw these uh, Streimel hats in the, in the opening scene of Babylon Berlin. Maybe um, some of you are familiar with Bess Meyerson, um, the lady in mink on The Big Payoff, the TV show um, from the 1950s, the, the first and only uh, Jewish Miss America who wore, um, who modeled the mink coats for men to win as prizes for their wives. Um, she's shown on the right here. So my, my point here is just that Jews and fur are sort of um, entangled in many ways, both in the history of fur production, also consumption. Um, there were many Jewish retail uh, dealers in Germany in the 1920s. Um, you can see their advertisements from Jewish newspapers also. Um, Jewish owned uh, uh, companies both making and selling uh, fur, but Jews were also consumers um, and um, notably conspicuous consumers of fur as, other, as with other luxury objects. Um, and one one film that we wanted one film clip we wanted to show you from the Weimar period sort of embodies this um, in a in a different kind of way. Um, the clip I want to show you, uh, and we're gonna when we show the clip from Fräulein Elsa, we're gonna mute the audio on that. Um, it's a silent film anyway, uh, but it's um, it's a 1929 silent film, so it's a very late silent film, um, and it it's a film that sh shows uh, a representation of Arthur Schnitzler's famous novella, Fräulein Elsa, um, but it changes the way that that Jewishness is depicted in that story in a couple of different ways. Um, the main character in the book, Elsa, is played here by Elisabeth Bergner, who's a German Jewish actress, and um, in the, in the novella, we know from Elsa's sort of stream of consciousness thoughts that she's She's Jewish and she doesn't deny her Jewish identity, but she also talks about how no one can see it on her. She's almost invisible as a Jew because of her blonde hair, whereas in the film we see a dark-haired actress who's a little more coded Jewish, um, but Jewishness is not discussed overtly in the film at all. Um, but we know from the, the literary context that both Elsa and the um, male figure who we encounter in this clip, Herr von Dorr's Day, uh, are both coded as Jewish or are both supposed to be Jewish. Um, and Herr von Dorsey actually blackmails her in the story uh, and tries to, um, in this case, he asks to view her naked body um, as a way of extracting um, something from her in return for the, the money, the financial uh, help he's going to give to her family. And she's going to save her family's honor by getting this money. But in this clip, we see her um, actually sort of on the verge of committing suicide, another trope often um, associated with German Jewishness. So. Um, what we'll see in, in this clip is uh, Elsa walking through her hotel. She's just taken um, the sleeping medication, Veronal. Uh, but you'll also see, I think, a glimpse of this sort of crazy Weimar era nightlife that we see in Babylon, Berlin, too. So if we could play the Fräulein Elsa clip with no sound, that would be great. So we see a jazz band in the beginning, and here we see Fräulein Elsa wearing a white fur coat that is not at all mentioned in the novella except as a coat, and here it's white and it's fur. And we see the dance hall. This is a little wobbly and confused. Great fashion inspiration. And Elsa's trying to fulfill her end of the promise here. She's wobbling over to uh, where she, she thinks she'll find Herr von Dorr's day. And this is a silent film, but we're supposed to be able to read her lips. She's saying Herr von Dorr's day. Right, there he is. That's... That's scandalous right there, folks. That's, that, that was nudity in the Weimar period, right there. <laughs> oh, uh, we're gonna stop now. This is another film. It's, it's interesting that this film, too, we did a program here not long ago on Vicki Baum's mention in Motel, yeah. uh, Grand Hotel, which was then adapted at MGM, and, and she had a hand in the screenplay as well. And that picks up on a number of the same themes of, of, of Freud. It hadn't occurred to me at the time. Hmm. 
Um, but also the neuronal and also the inability to kind of keep up appearances and sort of succumbing to the forces of modernity and, and, and so forth. These are these are themes that also I think crop up absolutely. in Schnitzler's source source text as well as in the, in the film. Um, and so here to relate this back to Babylon, Berlin, and why are we talking about fur so much? Um, the answer is uh, in the, the penultimate episode of what's on Netflix for you, so episode 15, which is the only episode, as far as I know, where we see actual swastikas and sort of, I, I think there's supposed to be SA members, um, you know, yeah, we brandishing. Yeah, we have a fleeting reference to Hitler early on at the Wannsee, but that's about it. Yeah, so here we're actually seeing you know, Nazis um, in a pack in, in the show, um, and this group of Nazis uh, is um, supposed to be sort of protesting or riding the arrival of a, the mayor who's purchased uh, using some kind of discount that was provided by the Sklarek brothers, um, a fur coat for his Jewish wife, and the Sklarek brothers are also um, Jewish, and that was part of the scandal, was that they uh, were involved in um, this sort of complicated fraud scheme. Um, swindling uh, the, the city out of money. Um, and so this, of course, leads to all kinds of anti-Semitic responses. Um, and here in this scene, we see um, people actually calling out that they're, they're upset about the mayor's wife having this mink coat um, and fur and mink on her Jewish bod, is, is the caption here uh, from the subtitles. So uh, we see this, again, this stereotype of Jewish opulence coming back um, as here's something that provoked an anti-Semitic response, we have people who are protesting the mayor's corruption, um, but also very closely linking it to Jewishness and Jewish wealth and stereotypes about Jewish wealth. And if we look back to Benda, I mean, Benda, and we mm -hmm. look back also to the slide, which you have the left side, the Zionist, kind of the, 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 the principles of, 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 of non-assimilation and pride and so forth, and on the right side, the liberal mm -hmm. uh, approach to it, you know, be a, which basically picks up on the 19th century idea of being a, a Jew at home. but. Mm -hmm. but and Benda very much incorporates, I think, or embodies that that liberal, that liberal ap approach. I mean, this is in the in the I think it's in the in the UK or even here. Then you get the expression uh, "think Yiddish, dress British," uh, mm. and and I think Benda is that 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 the very cultivated uh, liberal social democrat who embodies those those very principles that you had out, outlined in that in that one slide. Um, this year, just one of the the you know again fleeting references, these sort of subtle coded references mm -hmm. uh, to Jews in, and by the way, there's, for the, again, for those of you who haven't seen the series, this is in the, in the spring of 1929, the entire first two, uh, two seasons, again, 16 episodes, cover just, I think it's two months, in the late spring of 1929. And so the fact that you don't have more references to the rise of fascism apart from this the penultimate episode, or references to Hitler, also make a great deal of sense. It's, I mean, for, for audiences today in 20, 2017, 2018, it may seem uh, a glaring omission, but at that moment in time, it was not a straight and narrow path that led to the Nazi ascent to power in January of 33 by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely, and we do know that there are um, SA members, and I'm gonna to get to this in just a minute, sort of com committing um, attacks in broad daylight uh, in Weimar, Germany, um, but whether they would have been doing so in full uniform, even um, resembling this is, is uh, an interesting question. Um, so going back to why it was risky to appear Jewish in public in Weimar, Germany, and what kind of anti-Semitic attacks it might have prompted, um, I, I, one of the things that I discuss in the book is actually, um, something that we see taking place in Babylon, Berlin in a kind of interesting way, and that is um, how public spaces were negotiated, how people are sort of peering over each other's shoulders on trains, reading articles. Um, and we know that in Babylon, Berlin, um, for example, uh, Gerhard Rath sort of leans over the shoulder and sees a couple of articles in the Weltbühne, um, which is the, the left-leaning, not necessarily Jewish, but still sort of coded Jewish in the Weimar imaginary. Um, newspaper in which uh, his former roommate um, Samuel Katelbach had published several pieces. Um, and no, I don't know. You, would you like to talk about the sort of coded Jewish identity well, of Katelbach? Well, the Weltbühne was 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 edited was it by Jakobson for Jakobson mm -hmm. for, for for a number of years by other other Jewish prominent uh, editors. 
uh, who covered the cultural scene, especially in the, in the later years of the Weimar Republic. And in the series, you have this, this intellectual who lives in this boarding house together with Gary Onrad, who is the protagonist, the man from Cologne who moves to Berlin in order to help solve this uh, pornography ring. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of episodes that deal with their relationship. It's never really so much front and center. But we, again, have these allusions to what it is that this, that this neighbor of his does, who has a, a very, very strong Austrian accent. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the, the, the Austrian, uh, there's a Viennese doctor who, who, do, who, who do, works at the morgue, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't that right? He, she, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And these, both of these characters, I think, are, are once more these kind of subtle allusions mm -hmm. to Jewish figures in an otherwise completely uh, invisible way. So, so you have... The, the, for instance, the, the affiliation with the Weltbühne, mm -hmm. and then also by way of speech, accent, and it was not to say that all, all Viennese in Berlin were necessarily Jews, but I think that there are a number of interactions, as I recall, and I was trying to take notes at the time watching the series, with this, this uh, uh, fellow who works at the, the, the doctor. Is, mm -hmm. it, is it Schwartz? Is that it? I'm also blurring together the book and the, and the series, so yeah, it's one or the other. In the book, I think he's, he's, he has given that name. I'm not sure whether we actually ever really learned his name. But once more, it's these kind of fleeting, fleeting references that we get, um, which I don't think is a missed opportunity necessarily for the series. But I do think that it uh, helps to, to underscore a point that you make in, in the book, that for a number of Jews during the Weimar period, it was a matter of keeping that identity, at least in certain instances, private and keeping it uh, on the DL, so to speak, to use a 2018 expression. And on, on the DL, um, maybe translated into a, like a theoretical approach, might, um, we might use um, Kenji Yoshino's uh, yeah. book on covering, where he often ter uses the term downplay right. uh, in terms of thinking about how identities are, are pushed forward or also played and down. specifically homosexuality, to keep that then on the DL. Specifically, yeah. Um, so just to, to quickly um, show you a couple more images, I know we're, we're running a little low on time, so I want to wrap up, but we did see in the Weimar period um, anti-Semitic attacks. As I mentioned, they were, they were very random. They weren't necessarily following any kind of pattern, but um, one well-known set of riots or pogroms um, in 1923 took place in the Scheunenviertel. We see that name again. Um, but also um, what's interesting about some of the later attacks in 27 and 31 um, is that they were perpetrated against Jews and Jewish-looking persons who were located in the wrong place at the wrong time. So on, on Rosh Hashanah, for example, um, walking near a synagogue, looking like you might have just come from the synagogue, um, somehow looking Jewish in any other way might have been enough to, um, to get you attacked in, in Weimar, Berlin. Um, Cities, uh, urban spaces were quite different than rural spaces in terms of how people negotiated identity. Um, but I'm going to skip over this because I think we're low on time. Um, maybe I'll just say very briefly, um, for me, one of the most interesting passing narratives that I found about German Jewish passing, and um, this is a story that I think, uh, again, also ties together nicely with some of the earlier medieval history that I talked about. Um, this, this drama uh, called The Yellow Badge by author Jakob Löwenberg is about a woman, a German Jewish woman, who passes as non-Jewish for about two decades. And she does so um, in the interest of sort of helping her family you know, rise in the social scene. She passes as Christian, and she's, she's married to a Christian. Um, and she tells her children they're Christian. And her son joins an anti-Semitic uh, fraternity. And um, at one point, he's sort of making anti-Semitic remarks. And the mother can't take it anymore. And she says, you know, she, she lets him know that, that not only is she Jewish, she, and she's been passing for, for several decades, um, the son, he, he can't handle it. And we sort of see him, you know, go behind a closed door and, and um, kill himself uh, once he learns about this news. So the, the point I want to emphasize here um, is, is both that there were tragic consequences to passing and sort of this idea that... Um, passing was being told as a story, as a cautionary narrative. Um, people were telling people not to pass when they wrote stories about passing. 
Um, and they're also using and drawing on this terminology, the yellow badge is the title of this drama, going back to the Gelbe Fleck in German, going back to this medieval badge that was sort of projected onto people, um, but playing on that in a, in a very subtle way, thinking about how making Jewish identity visible might have been a good thing if it sort of protected one's uh, family from finding it out the hard way and the wrong way. Um, and this comes back to um, some of the passing narratives in, in the Harlem Renaissance in the sort of African-American context at this time where we see, um, again, what, what Adam Meyer has termed sort of anti-passing novels, talking about passing in a, in, and its negative consequences, its tragic, potentially tragic effects uh, as a way of prompting people not to pass, to think about identity as something they wanted to display more, more publicly and more visibly. Um, and of course, we see Degas the Fleck again thematized uh, once Hitler comes to power in the early Nazi period, um, where we see Robert Welsh, the editor of the Jüdische Rundschau, um, encouraging the readers of the Jüdische Rundschau uh, to wear the Jewish star with pride, uh, the, the Jewish, the yellow badge, which here is also um, associated with the Jewish star uh, with pride at the time. Um, so I think. Um, if we, if we had to make one more tie into Babylon Berlin, I would do it very quickly, um, just by saying also that the ways in which Jews displayed, displayed Jewishness during this time took many different forms. Um, sometimes they wore, uh, the members of um, Jewish affiliated fraternities wore, um, possibly in public, but more likely in sort of more private settings, um, yellow sashes and badges uh, to, to show this affiliation with Jewishness. The members of the Reichsbund Jüdischer Frontsoldaten, the Jewish War Veterans Association, um, which maybe is analogous to the Stahlhelmer in, uh, to Bruno Walter and his compatriots in um, Babylon, Berlin, in a way, um, the sort of group of veterans who are still thinking about World War I, um, they wore what you see on the right here, this pin that could be inserted into a jacket um, with the symbol J, sort of a little bit hard to discern here, but RJF stands for Reichsbund Jüdische Frontsoldaten. So this is sort of projecting Jewish identity and making it visible in a way that is um, subtle, but if you know what to look for, it's there. Um, here's another picture from the Leo Bex collection of a Jewish fraternity wearing their yellow couleur. Um, Jews also, at some point, stopped trying to argue with the narrative that Jews um, looked, well, they, they no longer tried to insist that they looked the same as everyone else and instead simply started trying to insist that they didn't look inferior. Um, and so in 1930, we see these prize contests uh, like this one in the Israelitisches Familienblatt where we see um, 20 children sort of being laid out here for you, and every reader can take part in the poll which of these 20 children is the most beautiful. So trying to find the most beautiful child as a way of contesting the fact that, or the assertion that Jews uh, looked racially inferior. Um, but we also see ways in, of changing one's identity in this period. Um, and this is where uh, we can come back to Svetlana Sorokina and her slipperiness uh, to conclude. Um, but. Uh, we know that in the 1920s and early 1930s, um, plastic surgery was easily uh, accessible and was starting to be advocated as something that could correct you know, nose mistakes, if you uh, literally translate this um, advertisement on the left here. Um, so anyone who looked Jewish but didn't want to look Jewish and wanted to sort of change some part about them that might be profiled as Jewish might have had that access, um, as, as Sandra Gilman has also, of course, written so much about um, through public through plastic surgery. Um, we also see uh, wigs being advertised here in the pictures on the right, um, specifically what uh, author Sami Gronemann sort of wittily terms the orthodox booby cop, this sort of orthodox page boy wig, so you can wear a shadle that looks you know, just like the one worn by Charlotte Ritter in Babylon, Berlin, and blend right in. Um, so uh, not only Jews, but also, of course, many others in the Weimar period were um, interested and invested in outward projections of identity, and I think that's where I would I would stop and open it up for questions. That's a perfect place to, to, to stop. Uh, we 
definitely have time for questions, and then we have time to buy lots of books and have them signed by Carrie. So. Do you want to take the questions? Or should uh, yeah, I think we have, so we have a microphone here. Uh, I'll be happy to, 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 to guide people. I think we saw a number, there's a hand here in the front, and then there were a couple heading backwards. So Frank, if you want to, I think the first one was maybe here. Yes, in, in two, two months, two months in, in and, the late uh, spring of 29. I'm just curious because, uh, you know, I've read so much and I can't think of anything, but Peter Gay's depiction of life in Berlin yeah. made it sound like, kind of like New York. Uh, <laughs> not, you know, where if you go to certain neighborhoods, you'll see ultra-Orthodox Jews, but yeah. that they were pretty much living uh, a pretty nice life up until a point. Well, the, the memorable phrase from his, from his, uh, Weimar culture, the outsider's insider from 1968, in light of the clip that we showed you, is a dance at the edge of a volcano. That's the way he described. And I think the 29 is when you're kind of at that precipice in a way. And so, and there, yes? That's still, it's, it's in, Chancellor, Chancellor, not President, but Chancellor, it's Hindenburg, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. Definitely not. No, no, no. But there was a foreign minister who was assassinated, assassinated in 1922. five years prior. Um, Seven years prior. But the other answer, and actually, Atina, who's right here, um, I remember once having a conversation with Atina where she said if she could go back to any um, moment in uh, the Weimar Republic, it would be, I don't remember exactly which month he said, but it was definitely 1929. The important... <laughs> Oh, in my mind, in my mind, I have 1929, but maybe I'm, I've gotten confused. You should have communicated that to Tom Tikva and his yeah, exactly. three uh, colleagues who created the show. But, yeah. but, but the, the other answer, just to give you a quick answer, is that it's before the stock market crash of 1929, right? It's before the Great Depression. It's before the volcano really gets, gets going. Yeah. What were you about to say about a moment in time in 1928 or 29? Uh, you didn't finish that thought. Oh, um, I, was, I was talking about a conversation I had with Atina Grossman, a historian of this period as well, who once told me that she would go back to a date in, that, in one of those years, but she hadn't, uh, I, I can't remember exactly the date that she gave me. It's a different well, version of Hot Tub Time Machine, I think, that you were <laughs> describing, right? My question was actually a comment about uh, Benda, the uh, police uh, mm -hmm. commissioner in Babylon, Berlin. And you pointed out it was uh, his Jewishness was sort of subtle. But there was an episode where he was arguing with his wife, or his wife was arguing mm -hmm. with him, since, as you recall, his wife, I believe, was Catholic, certainly not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was kind of giving him flack about uh, demonstrating his uh, menorah mm -hmm. and uh, things like that, if I recall. Putting it away, I think. Right? Didn't, there's some com conversation which, no? Could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's one conversation, and, but but it, it's along with other precious objects. I think it's when the cleaning woman is coming, and I, it's it's unclear whether she means to put it away to hide his Jewishness, or because she doesn't want the cleaning woman, you know, marching off with these precious objects. So, again, sort of bound up in other fears, other other issues concerning class and so forth. Yes, the uh, the, the uh, film, the, the series was taken in 1928. And it shows us, uh, as a cautionary tale almost, what happened in 1928. But the film, the series itself, was made now. Made now, but set uh, in, 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 in two months in 29. Okay. Two months in 29. So if, I may, ask, 29. if I may ask the question. So yeah. if it was made now, yes. and so much money was spent on it, what is the purpose of Fif bringing this film dollars. out now? This I think is, it's, uh, it's yeah, a good question. So, 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 so Tom Tikver, and some of you may know his other work, especially Lola Ren, Run, Lola Run, which was the first film I think that really catapulted him to international fame. He and his three collaborators, writers, producers, uh, they decided that the Weimar Republic was a period that had clearly broader appeal and had not, apart from what Fassbinder did in his his 14-hour adaptation of Alfred de Blin's novel of 1929, Berlin Alexanderplatz, that the New York Review of Books Classics just brought out in a new translation just last month. Um, apart from that, that they, they, they felt that really hadn't been sufficiently explored and really tapped into in a kind of, in a very popular vein. 
And I would be the last person to dispute that this is really aimed at a very popular audience, and there are all sorts of things that are sexed up and romanticized, and, and I'll stop there. But my response would be, I think that the shows, if it has a political aim um, or a larger message other than entertainment value, um, it's just to get you to think about the paths that sort of ordinary people lived in this period that might have taken them in certain political directions. Um, so by the end, you feel like you have a, a slightly better, or deeper understanding of the choices that people made about their, their political affiliations. There's the, the, the microphone's all, all the way in the back. So when you're done, then Frank, I think up here we have one in the front. So go ahead. Um, the scene that you showed, which um, I found very powerful when I was watching the series, um, struck me as anachronistic. And I wonder whether you agreed with that. The arms up yeah. like this are what the kids do now. Yeah. Uh, and but they're also reminiscent of a Nazi salute. Kids do now. And did they import that into uh -huh. it in order to uh, give us the creeps about the possibility that they were uh, not doing the Nazi oh, salute per se, but close, right? So, so yeah, they're doing, and, and it is haunting, and it's haunting, I think, especially from the vantage point of today. But what they're doing when she's doing the dance on on stage is they're holding up their fingers like this, right? It's not quite the, what Seinfeld would call the Heil Five. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, just, it's just one. The dance might be, I, I don't think, I don't read it as anachronistic choreographically speaking, but I think it's, I, I think that's what he's yeah. asking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there is, there's so much about that scene that I think is haunting. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, again, once more, and this is in keeping, I think, with these vague illusions that proliferate throughout the, the film, that today, through today's eyes, it's hard to look at that with, and, and see them holding up their arms like that and not to anticipate what will come uh, a mere four years later. Uh, sorry, he's been waiting here in the front, and then I think we can go back to the other. That's my, I'm doing my best, folks. Please don't take offense, but your hand has been up. It was like this, I think, your hand. <laughs> <laughs> It was the Wesleyan salute. I'm going to come out first and foremost as uh, the fourth Wesleyan person. Oh, is that right? In the front. So yeah. we have a Wesleyan mafia. Mm -hmm. as, yeah, that's yeah. what we're called. Um, we have the same professors we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst uh, now by trade. I was a history major at Wesleyan and took courses, I'm sure, with the same people. Um, and as an analyst, I'm interested in these very issues about identity, um, I'm interested in trauma, but in identity. And what I read in the series, which I only watched last night, uh, binging of sorts, and understand from your paper and from my work is uh, this period and others, I think currently, and what we're experiencing as a reaction to, uh, is the ambiguity um, and the what surrounds uh, the difficulty or the ambiguity of reading other people, or even reading oneself um, in terms of appearance, in terms of belief, mm -hmm. in terms of what can be concealed, Jewish at home, or Jewish internally, but not necessarily externally, and another faction saying, no, no, externally mm -hmm. is good, it's what's, it's what's needed, um, uh, and who decides, ultimately, who controls uh, what we reveal what we conceal we th one thinks one does or the subject believes he or she does but that's not always the case and and i detect and experience this this ambiguity there mm -hmm. uh, and i i don't know the names of all the characters but i think this one uh, uh, certainly believes she controls it mm -hmm. and she does i mean she's a master mm -hmm. of that but there are moments where she doesn't where that collapses, and she comes into great danger. Uh, and in the you know, 11th hour, she rescues herself, um, uh, what, thinking of the knife, uh, when the guy pulls the knife on her, and she does something. But I wonder if you could respond to that, about the ambiguity of identity, which increases after the war, because there is more freedom, and therefore more ambiguity, uh, and the control over identity, and how almost um, which will then be erased by the Nazis. Sure. 
Yeah, so um, thanks for this um, very detailed question. Um, there's a negotiation of identity going on right now. Um, but for um, the, the response I would give is um, that this ambiguity that you identify is exactly what um, many people strive to cultivate um, in terms of dual legibility, in terms of being ident identifiably Jewish to the right people who know how to look for the right cues at the right time in the right place, um, but perhaps invisible to those who might um, bear more hostile inclinations. True as well in, uh, you know, in terms of codes mm -hmm. of queerness. Absolutely. There are a couple, there were two hands. There's one there and then one there. And I think we'll, we'll, there'll be lots of time for questions right there and there. You said two more, is that right? And then you, the best time for questions is when you're buying a book and having it signed. That's the, that's the ideal time for a question, if you ask me. Sorry, Carrie, I'm not going to let go. That's okay. Uh, when you, uh, and wine, exactly, with wine and books. Yeah, there's and, snacks. Please. Yeah. Uh, when uh, I think of uh, Weimar culture, uh, I certainly think of uh, a number of key players who were Jewish. Mm -hmm. in terms of artists, giving one example, uh, Kurt Weill. Mm -hmm. And Kurt Weill, I'm, I just want you to comment on this. Uh, Kurt Weill certainly uh, used some uh, Yiddish melodies, mm -hmm. Yiddish tunes in his composition, which went on to be huge successes. Uh, so I wonder if you would comment on Jewish artists uh, being very, very strong uh, um, players, key players in the yeah. culture. Yeah, and they're even referenced in the, you know, if we go to a deeper level, if we kind of go subterraneous in the film, it's not even really subterraneous, but it's just, it's just once more, a little bit beneath the surface. We do have some compositions in the film, and, and Tom Tick for himself oversaw with the composer the music choices and even composed a number of the, of the songs, riffing on vial. But in the uh, within, sort of folded with, uh, folded into, uh, uh, and it's it's again ahistorical because this is a film that debuted in February of 1930. But there are two moments when they're watching Menschen am Sonntag. Menschen am Sonntag, People on Sunday, was an entirely Jewish affair. It was co-directed by Edgar Ulmer and Robert uh, Siodmak. It was scripted by Billy Wilder, uh, together with Robert Siodmak's little brother, uh, Kurt Siodmak. Uh, you had Eugen Schriftan on the camera together with a very, very young Fred Zinnemann holding the, holding the cables, basically. Um, and, and, and this is referenced in the, in, in, in the film. You also have then Josef von Sternberg. You have the, 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 uh, the screen test of Marlene Dietrich. Uh, again, a historical, <laughs> but still. So you have these references in the series. And of course, the Three Penny Opera. Uh, and Three Penny Opera as well. And then the music uh, we have uh, uh, from, from Fritz Lang's M, there's the, there's the riffing upon uh, uh, the Edvard Grieg composition as well. Grieg was not Jewish, but it's is incorporated into Lang's, Lang's film. So you have a number of subtle allusions, but again, riddled with ambiguity. You had a question. So I was very much struck by how much that scene reminded me of um, the Time War. The, and I mean, it was just so similar. And, Did you see we were throwing rice at one point? Uh, <laughs> uh, but also, I, I was kind of um, uh, a little sad that the, there were no words. You know, I was dying to hear oh, what she was saying, yeah. singing, and I what they were. I, they were singing. I, apologies, I prepared that clip from a source that didn't give the subtitles. When you watch it on Netflix, you will have the you will have the subtitles. Uh, apologies for that. That's oh, my that's my doing. To, to but, ashes to dust. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah, that is yeah, that is oh, sorry. The title of the of the of the song yes is to ashes to dust. But there's much more to it than just that. Stolen that's the refrain. The that's the title. Uh, but you have the fully sub sub subtitled uh, lyrics in. When you, when you stream it on Netflix. Okay. Now it sounds like I'm making a plug for Netflix. Oh, no. Um, but, well, yeah. Thanks to both Joe and Carrie, and please. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you available in conversation. Uh, there's wine and cheese, as well as books. Yes. To buy and sign. Books. Yes. <laughs>